live shows. So prepare your questions if you have any and keep posting them. We've just come out of a series where we're talking about retirement and specifically pensions. And, you know, it was quite a useful session and we learned so many different things. And I would invite you to go back. I usually leave these videos up so you can actually refer back to them uh, as and when you want to. Uh, but for now, I just want to make a comment about that. Where we, we, you know, we talked about the importance of pensions. In my view, it's important to invest in other things because the money that you invest in pensions helps with security in your retirement, but it's not enough. I mean, you just don't want basics covered. You also want to be able to thrive and enjoy your retirement and do amazing things. And to do that, then you need to sort of invest in a bit more riskier opportunities. I mean, the kind of returns you get from retirement companies is low because they are conservative by nature. So you'll find that you'll earn something between 8 to maybe 10, 12 percent. Uh, and over time, you know, you do get returns, but not exciting ones. So please um, note that you will need to invest in other things. And we'll be talking about that. But today, I um, have a fantastic guest. I'm so excited to host this gentleman. And he is name, his name is Tony Wainaina. And Tony Wainaina um, has had an amazing career. He started off at, as, at um, ICDC, and ICDC, which now then became Centum, was actually formed by the government, I think in the 60s, or right after independent, independence, um, uh, for, you know, to provide Kenyans with opportunities to pull funds together and invest in private equity. Um, and so, I mean, all through his career, he's sort of just been in private equity and in helping chamas and investment clubs and investment companies. And then from there went to TransCentury and as the CEO um, and sort of just putting the systems and structures in place. And then from there went to Fanisi. Uh, uh, and at Fanisi, he was a managing partner and it's a private equity firm. So I cannot imagine anybody else on, on in this country who is better placed to answer the question that I have on investing as a group or as many people together. And so I want to give you a warm welcome. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you, Rina. Thank you, Rina. And thank you for it's making the time. It's a pleasure to be here. Karibu sana. Yes. Yeah, so I was, you know, sort of giving a bit of background on retirement mm -hmm. and pensions. Yeah. And I'd like to hear your thoughts on, on that. Okay. Well, as you said, <coughs> um, relying on pensions or so the pension schemes uh, that we have available in this country for retirement income is simply not enough. I think for any one of us who has been in, in employment over the years, um, the one scheme that we're all very familiar with is the NSSF. And um, from the very beginning, I can remember contributing, I think when I started, it was 160 shillings yeah. a month. Um, that went up to an astronomical 200 <laughs> shillings a month. <laughs> <laughs> and despite the passing of the bill, the pensions bill, which I think was in 2013, mm -hmm. Um, they still have not implemented, um, for as far as I know, the uh, recommendations to increase that amount. And uh, I think the idea was to have um, the employer and employee each contribute 6% um, respectively. Yes. Yes. But there was, a, there was a cap on the amount of income that, uh, you know, on, on, on which this 6 or total of 12% could be levied. And um, on average, the total contribution would only come to about 2,160 shillings, as far as I remember. Mm. Now, if you look at the reality, you know, what do the numbers really tell us? Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll give you an example of uh, someone in their, in their mid-30s that is um, looking to retire at the age of 60. Mm -hmm. And they are looking for a retirement income of about 100,000 uh, shillings um, a month net income after tax. Now, for them to achieve this over that 25-year um, period, they would have to be saving and investing just under 20,000 shillings a month. That's giving them returns of about 13% net. Okay? Um, for how many years? For 25 years, continuously, over and over again. So you benefit from the power of compounding, um, you are not, you know, um, uh, you have to reinvest the entire amount mm. uh, of interest and uh, the, the returns that you're generating. Um, so when you compare 2,000 shillings and 20,000 shillings, there's a, mm. there's a huge difference, yeah. okay? Um, so 
the, the, the other statistics that um, you know are, are out in the public are something known as the net replacement rate um, NRR and yeah. net replacement rate is simply um, the, uh, the the income the retirement income um, that you will be generating post retirement as a percentage of what you were earning before retirement right. rule of thumb says if you are able to generate, say, between 60 and 75 percent, you know, that sh that's an adequate amount for you to survive on post-retirement. In Kenya today, the average is just under 43 percent. That is for contributors that are between the age of 25 and 35. Okay. So they have a long period of time before they, they have to retire. Um, but for those in their 40s and 50s, you know, it's between about zero and 20 percent, which means that post retirement, mm. the majority of Kenyans today are earning significantly less than what uh, they were earning during their productive years. Yeah. And that's taking into account the retirement schemes that we have in place. So if on average um, you're able to replace up to 43 percent of your income, yeah. where is the rest coming from? You know, you, you don't have to look at uh, generating 100% of what you were earning before retirement. But even to get to that 75%, where is it coming from? Right. So that's why, um, in my opinion, we have to become a lot more independent about how we generate this income. And that's why I'm a very, very big advocate of um, taking matters into our own hands and making the most of these chamas mm. that many of us uh, are members of uh, investment groups because they have uh, they provide the opportunity for members to pool their funds to invest those funds year month after month year after year and to see those funds generate the call it that gap uh, of income that is required to allow you to 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 retire comfortably and there are a number of examples you know success stories yeah uh, charmers that have been able to to do just this uh, over the years yeah you know yeah. We, we hear about the success stories and we see them yeah um i am um, i i come from a family uh where my my, my parents have been involved in, in chamas yeah. and so actually when i grew up and as as i grew up and even now just watching them and seeing that success uh has actually encouraged me to go ahead and mm -hmm. and, and, and invest in, in a chama mm -hmm. but it's been tough it's not easy and yeah. i remember you know, just getting to a stage where I was just like, I mean, is it just me or this, does this chama thing even work? Uh, and I reached out to a friend um, and did a bit of research and then found your book, mm -hmm. you know, the investment handbook, yeah. which I have, you know, it's in all colors and, you know, highlights <laughs> and I've marked it because I, I have just benefited so much from this book. But, you know, the reality is people have had horrifying experiences. Yeah. We're going to go through... Um, you know, some of the things that I, I think were just really insightful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. However, before we get there, I want to share something that uh, somebody said to me. And um, he said, my Chama stories have never gone well. Mm -hmm. My first one out of compass was mainly focused on buying shares. It wasn't registered. So we had to buy in individuals names. When life happened and we needed to take to break apart, those individuals in, in whose names we opened accounts kept the shares for themselves and you know as I've talked to different people they've had you know similar kind of experiences um, and so I'd just like us to sort of just begin there what are, th what are the mistakes that we make hmm. when it comes to chamas okay yeah um, well looking at that specific example yes. um, to start with I think it's very clear that um, from the very beginning um, there were no and and I refer to what I call um, the, the three uh, sort of uh, principles or value drivers um, that you really need to keep in mind as a Chama. Okay, one is commitment. The other one is trust and governance. And that specific, those specific two relate to that uh, mm. particular Chama. And the other one is vision, okay? Yeah. But um, if you are um, now pulling money together you don't have a structure around this entity, okay? You're relying on the individuals to actually uh, make the investments through. 
unless you have, it's, it's one thing to, to trust each other, you know, sort of word of mouth. Yeah. But uh, there's a reason why governance structures exist. There's a reason why we have, you know, li limited liability companies or, 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 or entities that are um, uh, sort of governed by statutory requirements through government. It's because inevitably something will go wrong. Mm -hmm. And if something goes wrong, how do you protect um, the stakeholders in, in that group? So you, you don't pool your money to then give money to individuals to invest in their own names, yeah. okay? <laughs> because inevitably things will go wrong. Yeah. You know, other needs, as you were saying, life happens. Yeah. And if life happens, your instinctive reaction is that it's, th it's about me now mm. and my own family. Self-preservation. Self-preservation, mm. exactly. <laughs> and it's downhill from there. Yeah. It's so true. Um, so the question then I ask is, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we, we, when you put your money in a bank mm -hmm. or you put your money with a, uh, an investment company, mm -hmm. People are very, you know, what has, how has my money done? What's going on with this? And why haven't I received my statement? But when it comes to investment groups, why do mm. you think mediocrity exists? We sort of just, we put money and then we don't even ask mm. for accounts. We don't get audits done. We mm. don't register companies yeah, and, yeah. and ensure that those governance structures are in yeah, place. Yeah. yeah. I think the simple answer to that is uh, we don't take our trauma seriously as seriously as we take our own jobs, whether we are employed or whether we are in self-employment. Because, you know, you know that if you don't take this job seriously, or if you don't take your business seriously, then um, you will suffer the consequences. I mean, you cannot generate income month after month after month. You cannot keep customers. You cannot keep suppliers. Um, but we tend to adopt a very laid-back and, um, you know, informal attitude when it comes to Chamas. The, you know, I refer to what's called the taking a social approach and a business approach to a Chama. Many of us take the social approach. And, I mean, and it's a good thing that actually creates this bond between the membership. Um, you know, they uh, came together as friends yeah. or family or colleagues. And it's, it's this bond that ties them together. Um, but... When it comes to money, mm. investing money, you've got to step away from that sort of informal sort of social attitude around your money uh, because you're looking for returns at the end of the day, okay? Mm. So I instead of meeting at a restaurant or a bar, you know, for your uh, monthly chama meeting, you need to find a, s a serious venue. It's a meeting room. Um, not in sitting rooms? Like not in, like not in sitting rooms, <laughs> because uh, all manner of things will interfere with this business activity. And as you said uh, much earlier on, it is not easy. It's, it's hard. It is hard work. And it's, uh, you know, that is the only way that you are going to make these uh, charmers succeed. You've got to change your mindset and move away from uh, treating it as something informal to something that is a lot more formal but that can benefit you significantly if you take it seriously for a long period of time. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Um, there's a statement that you made in your book, mm. and you say that you believe that investment, the investment group phenomenon is a sleeping giant, provided the conventional passive model of the investment club or chama is turned inside out, upside down, mm. back to front. Mm -hmm. Please help me understand what you mean. <laughs> Okay, um, and this is the reason why the Chama phenomenon has been of such interest and, and passion to me. We, we have an inherent, I think you find this in, the, in a lot of African societies, it's not just a Kenya phenomenon, across the continent. Mm. Um, we come together to uh, tackle certain challenges and, and, and issues. Uh, if we want to organize um, a wedding or a funeral or fundraising for medical reasons. The instinctive, you know, way of doing this is to call your people, okay? Your family, your friends, let's come together. Let's changa. We have harambees, we have what, and we will achieve our objective, right. okay? So it's not hard to get people to actually come together 
and contribute every month. That's the easy part, mm -hmm. okay, as a, as a chama. But what happens after that um, is, is the big question. And uh, if we take these, if we move away from passive investing to active investing, if we move away, I talked about mindset, from informal to formal, you can then convert this inherent gift, which I, I call it, that we have mm. of um, uh, naturally just coming together to, to raise money yeah. into um, a pool of capital that if it is deployed well, can actually, you know, be phenomenal in terms of, you know, I I in terms of outcomes. Just look at the SACO movement. Okay. I think that's a case in point. Yeah. But SACOs will typically pool money together <coughs> um, for lending purposes among the yes. membership, okay? Mm. Not specifically for investing, which is what chamas mm. do. Mm. And SACOs have been a huge success. But I think SACOs have only manage to um, achieve a fraction of what they can, all right? Politics gets in the way. Um, they, uh, you know, they're, they're limited in terms of not being able to take their ability to save money mm -hmm. uh, to just lending amongst themselves. So you will save as a SACO. You will then borrow from that SACO, very generous terms, much better than banks, it's much easier. And um, you also have this peer pressure phenomenon that is uh, such a powerful thing uh, for chamas, for sacos, to make sure that you make, you service those loans, yeah. okay? But you're then giving the job of investing to the individual, okay? Not to the group. And I talk in the book about enhancing that power of what the group brings. You each come with certain skills. Right. Um, you each have a vision in terms of what you want in the next 20, 30 years, as, you know, especially when you get to retirement. Um, and how can you han enhance the power of this group to actually invest in, in instead of leaving um, the decision to invest to your typical advisors, okay? So if we're able to enhance the power that uh, we have as a, as a I, I call it a God-given gift mm. uh, of being able to contribute as groups month on month, year on year, into an effective investment vehicle. You know, whenever we need to raise money, and, and, and this is um, a, a phenomenon I think really became embedded in me during my experience at ICDCI, which is now Centre. That's essentially what happened. When Aichi got together, they pulled their money. And, and look where Centum is today. Amazing. Yeah, Centum was just a big chama, mm. okay? And um, if there's a, I, I'll take Safaricom as an example. When they were looking for local investors uh, at the very beginning, um, instead of giving that 5% to certain people, which shall remain unmentioned, mm. um, <laughs> if, if chamas were able to actually pull their resources together, yeah. they could have been that sort of strategic investor or that local investor that could have benefited significantly more than okay. each of us going in as an individual, right. you know, during the IPO. And that applies to everything else, infrastructure, um, investing in the country, you know, where are we getting money from? Mm -hmm. We all look at the IFCs yeah. and the, the multilateral uh, investors, the bilateral investors, um, the DFIs yes. for, for investment income. But we have it. It's right here. It's right here. Wow. Yeah. It's, it's really a mind, shift that yeah. the, a mind shift that needs to happen Absolutely. in all of us. And so I want to see how can we actually then achieve that. Mm -hmm. There's an example of, a, of an investment group that you use in your book called mm -hmm. Sweet. You know, you've <laughs> kind of renamed them. Yes. And, you know, I read this story of this group and I was like, oh my gosh, I feel like you were talking about me, mm -hmm. you know, or us yes, <laughs> yes. as an investment group. And yeah. so these guys, you know, just to briefly say the story, they start off nicely. Oh. You know, I think there were three friends. They yeah. come together. They invite five other friends. Mm. I think they ended up being 12. Yes. And then they started to invest. Yes. You know, they invested in land. They invested yeah. in shares as we typically mm -hmm. do. 
but the way they invested in the land, you know, it was this person, this member's brother yes. or cousin who <laughs> yes, exactly. got a piece of land somewhere, exactly. only to find out that there was no title or there was, that land had an issue. Exactly. And then they put money in a stockbroker. Unfortunately, that stockbroker went under yeah. and it was just chaos. Yeah. And um, they didn't do due diligence. Mm -hmm. And so it ended up not working out. Yeah. But what was interesting for me to see is that they were actually able to turn things around. Mm. There were 12, ended mm. up being three because mm. people left. Mm. What is that that you've seen with all the different investment groups? And how can somebody listening to this who's been in that experience yeah. where I've been in a group, I mean, the issues are different, but really they end up being at the place where ah, I'm done mm. and I'm quitting this mm. thing. Mm. It's a waste of my time. Yes. And the vision for, you know, the kind of picture you've painted mm -hmm. is gone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what would you say, how do you recover? What are the steps you would take from being in such a place? Because we saw that suite actually yeah, yeah. then recovered and they're doing Correct. well now. But Correct. yeah. Okay. Um, yes, yeah, sweet. Sisters with Eternal Energy and Trust. That's where the name came from. And it's really um, a combination, an amalgamation of real life experiences that groups that... Um, I've had the privilege of being able to advise, had gone through. Um, and, and it resonates with a lot of other groups. And um, it goes back to what I had mentioned earlier on about the mindset. Okay, So they came together, a social group. And um, they just wanted to form a chama as the, their parents had done, as their relatives and friends in the past had done, to pool money together to invest. Um, but right from the outset you know the, the the mindset was informal and it was passive okay and there, there's a lot of you know uh trust that is given to to the membership yeah um but there, there are certain principles that you would apply to a serious investment company that you must apply to your charmer from the outset you're, you're investing in land okay um you need to do your due diligence get your lawyer to do a search. Is this uh, title in the name of the person that is selling it to you? Is it encumbered uh, or not? Um, are there issues around that title? Um, before you actually put down a single shilling in terms of a, of a deposit, who is actually doing this transaction for you? Or who are you buying from? I, I, I always caution members to avoid involving uh, family members as, um, as, as agents yeah, when, they're doing their transactions. when they're doing their transactions yeah. because it's, it's, a, it's a business transaction yeah. and if something goes wrong and you have to end up in court you don't want to end up in court with your relatives yeah. okay um, so you, you've got to make sure that um, your due diligence is done exactly um, who are you dealing with even if it comes to professional service providers like brokers remember we had that period of time was it about 10 years ago when we had a crisis in the in the brokerage uh, community in in kenya when we had a number of brokers that actually went under there were all kinds of <coughs> uh, governance issues around them uh, ethical issues around how they were doing their business and um, the whole all these issues regarding insider trading and you've got to do your due diligence on your broker okay get them to show you um, just as you would do in any in any company I mean what is your track record do um, uh, due diligence on the per person on I really believe in doing due diligence on individuals themselves okay what kind of character is he uh, what sort of past has he had um, and then you know entrust your because you're entrusting your money to these people yeah. okay just as you would do with a bank you're not just going to put your money, you know, in, in any bank. And we're trustworthy. Yes. yes. You are an <laughs> exception. You are an exception. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> Especially since you've been around this long. Yes. But others have fallen by the wayside, yeah? yeah? E with your lawyer. You know, cheap can also be very expensive. True. I always say this. Yeah. And it's, it's an investment you're making in a good lawyer, a good broker, a good bank, um, you know, at, at every level, a company secretary, you know. I'm not saying you go for the very, very top, which is unaffordable for many of these chamas. But, you know, look for tier two, tier three advisors that do have a very solid track record. So, you know, again, 
Sweet did not do these things. You know, they, they went through their, you know, I know so and so. Okay, you know them, fine. Let's, let's but you work. You see, the reason them. is, yeah. at, at, when you're starting off, you're probably starting off with 5,000 contribution per person. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You don't want to spend all that money mm -hmm. on advisors or yeah. experts. Yeah. So, how can you still get the expertise that you need, putting yeah. the right structures and systems in place? without spending too much? St start, start with yourselves, okay? So you start with having those governance structures in place in terms of uh, the decision-making process around making those investments. So you're starting off with 5,000, there are 10 of you. So every month you're raising 50,000. So in inevitably, at the beginning, you're, you are going to be doing some relatively passive investing, okay? Uh, so who are we going to entrust our money to as a broker, as an advisor to buy these shares? Yeah. Okay. So you have options you know, of all the brokers in the country. Um, and they are all going to charge you <laughs> the same fees at the end of the day. Okay. But there is night and day between a good solid broker and, and one that just does not have mm. that, that track record. Same with your bank. Um, wh when it comes to spending money, you know, uh, three or five years down the road, when you have raised a lot more money and you now need to bring your company secretaries or lawyers on board or auditors, auditors and all the rest of it. Um, one of the services we offered is that we, we had to do the due diligence ourselves as, as origins and create a panel of recommended service providers that were affordable, mm. that had the credibility, and I'm telling you, it's, it's not easy. I mean, one of the things that really surprised me was how hard it was to find a firm that could provide accountancy services, all right? Just doing your monthly, quarterly management accounts, yeah? Um, and it took uh, a number of years to actually come up with three to five that could be trusted, that wow. actually delivered. That okay? long? That long. It took long. There are a lot of cowboys in this uh, country who present themselves as credible. Um, but if you don't do your homework, give, uh, give me references, okay? Even beyond the references, can I find others that this accountant or auditor has worked with that I can talk to? Mm. And you, you, you will hear horrifying stories um, at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's, it's a step-by-step-by-step -by -step -by -step process. You know, you've got to walk before you're, you're able to run yeah. at the end of the day. But there's some very simple principles, starting with yourselves, around how you can... Um, really, you know, and I call this formation and structuring, how you can really um, establish yourself and, you know, after a certain period of time, this becomes business as usual, all right? Just as you do in FIDA, okay? Mm -hmm. You know, th there are certain structures you have put in place. Mm -hmm. You have an auditor, you have a, all manner of professional service providers that you've been with for years now that you implicitly trust, yeah. and that's the same mindset that uh, a charmer really needs mm. to have, yeah. Everything is in the mindset, I tell it you. It is mindset, yes. Wow, okay, so before we go into the questions mm -hmm. people are asking, um, there's something that you say in your book, and I'm not gonna try and look for it now, mm -hmm. but I wrote it down. It's something about um, you need to save mm -hmm. what you cannot afford to lose. Mm -hmm. And I remember when I first read that, I was mm -hmm. like, ouch. Yeah, you know, yeah. because you kind of save what you can afford. Mm. I mean, mm. what you would spend in a restaurant on, on yes. a week, in a weekend yes, yes. is typically what we find yeah. ourselves investing in. Exactly. But you're saying you need to save what you cannot afford to lose. Yes. Tell me why. Because, again, it comes back to mindset. You begin to take this money more seriously. If um, your uh, each contributing 2,000 shillings. Uh, you're earning half a million, 400,000 shillings uh, a month, okay? You know, that, that's a fraction of, of what you're, you're earning. And it doesn't hurt you if, for whatever reason, that money disappears, okay? The uh, 400,000? No, 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 the 2,000 shillings a oh. month <laughs> <laughs> that you're contributing. <laughs> yes, if it disappears, you lose it. It's, you, it's yeah. no big deal, yeah. okay? Mm. And this is why, you know, we came across a very interesting phenomena with many of the groups that we have advised. Many of these members are not even aware of how much they've contributed over the past 
five, six, seven years. If you ask them what is the value of their shareholding in that chama, they can't tell you. Mm. What is even more shocking is that after, you know, working with a number of these groups, you discover that the amount of money that they have contributed, that they have contributed compared to the, the value of that, of, the, of that investment over the years, the value of that investment in some cases is between 40 and 50 percent of what they've contributed. Wow. So it's just they've just been making losses. They've been losing. They have been losing. They've invested wherever, in land, in shares. In yeah, so that's why people say it doesn't work. Yeah. But, but you know, if, you, if you're not paying attention, again, I come back to your company. And that's why you have monthly management accounts. So you can account for every single shilling mm. that has been spent. Okay? If you are a fund manager that is responsible to their clients, okay, mm. that fund manager has to, um, on a, literally on a daily basis, understand the valuation of the money that they're investing on behalf of other people right. because they're accountable to these other people. So you, you as a... As a chama, you need to feel this accountability to the rest of the group. Again, mindset shift. Otherwise, years and years will go by. And, you know, you, many of these chamas are simply contributing so that they can remain. It's a social thing. Mm. Feel that they are still part of this group. But what is secondary completely is the contribution they are giving because they can afford to lose it. Mm. But if you step that up from 2,000 to 20,000 to 40,000 to 50,000, you know, even say I'll put aside 5 to 10% of my earnings, of my salary every month in, in this chama. But the chama has to work for you. You know, it's got to be able to generate the returns that keep you engaged and serious about continuing and staying on with that chama. You know, so it's sort of reverse psychology as well. Because it's not performing, why should I take it seriously? And I'm just going to sit back and not bother, even thinking about contributing more money. But before you start committing a larger proportion of your income as contributions to these chamas, you know, there are a number of things you've got to correct, okay? So whether it's investment planning, whether it's how you undertake your administration and management of your groups, um, how you execute these investments, you know. Buying land shouldn't take you two to three years. It should does it take that long? For some of these groups, it does. <laughs> because there's no clear assigned responsibility okay. of who, who is actually um, responsible for doing this. Mm. If you think, I've got a full-time job, I'm going to do this over the weekend, okay? So you're not taking it as seriously as you would, you know, um, a serious investment group or your job. Um, so you end up taking so much longer executing investments than you should take. You know, it shouldn't take you, say, uh, more than six to nine months to actually have the whole transaction. Mm -hmm. And all this contributes to how, how, how effectively that group is earning uh, returns. Mm. Because remember, it's all about compounding. If you can deploy your capital and start earning interest much sooner, you have a much longer time for, for that income to compound. Yeah. 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 Wow. I mean, in case somebody missed that, mm -hmm. you can start a chama and you decide you're going to start contributing to it. If you don't care, the average statistics show from origins that over the time that they've looked back, some of these chamas have 40% of what they have contributed because mm -hmm. of not paying attention to it. Yeah. So if you're not going to pay attention, basically what you're saying, don't even bother don't starting. Don't bother starting. Because you're just going to lose your money. Exactly, exactly. But if you're going to do this thing, you need to do it properly. Yep. And you ha please tell me those values again. Yes. There were vision. There's vision. There's commitment. And that's both financial and time commitment. Yes. There's trust. trust. Absolutely yes. important between members. Yeah. We've had countless examples of members who have defrauded being dishonest with the money that yeah. belongs to the group because emergencies have come up and I will borrow this money for two months. Nobody is going to notice anything. And when I get the money back, I'll put it back. Yeah. And governance. Okay? So governance simply means you've got to have, um, and, you know, step by step, it will take some time, um, a, a board that is accountable. So if you're 15 of you, have five of you, 
who form this board of directors. Um, you have to have um, uh, accountability between those directors, so they are signing uh, uh, not only a code of conduct, but um, um, like uh, terms of reference, mm. uh, board charters to make. And again, these may all sound like fancy words, but they must <laughs> apply to your chama, because that's the only way you can instill that, this level of seriousness. Yeah. Um, and, and if you have governance in place, governance and trust are interrelated completely. Then, you know, you can go about your business trusting each other um, because, you know, it's, it's, it's a very fragile institution, this chama, at the end of the day as well. Yes, you may all be friends, but once trust is broken, yeah. once you begin to form cliques, which is another thing that happens a lot with, with these groups, um, you, you begin to distrust each other, your... Uh, your willingness to actually continue contributing or taking this uh, chama seriously is significantly diminished. And um, again, it goes back to treat this as a formal investment company. That's what it's all about. Mm. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, I'm seeing time has gone. Okay. Before I ask my other questions, I want mm -hmm. to just check quickly whether we have any questions that have come through. Mm -hmm from the people who are viewing. So we have a question by Tanya. At what age should one consider joining a chama? Mm -hmm. And um, what's the title of the book? So let me talk about the book before okay. you answer. So first okay. of all, this book, by the way, is a, like a hand, it is actually says it's in the investment book, handbook. I don't know if you can see it there. And basically takes you through step by step process on how to begin where you should start, how to create those board charters he's talking about in case that one flew over mm -hmm. your head. You know, it even has templates, which is so amazing. Like right at the back, there's um, an appendix where you can find templates for different things, how to write minutes. You have a minute template in the book, um, just all kinds of templates, how to do NDAs. If you want to put in an expression of interest for a company you want to buy, you know, it's very, very, very helpful. In fact, it was so helpful for me when I read it that I got every member of my Chama to buy one for themselves so that we can have a book club within the Chama, read through it, understand it, and implement these things. And it's been so, so helpful for us. So I would highly, highly recommend it. So in fact, before we answer those questions, yes. I want to say something. Yeah. Um, you know, Tony, I've written a book as mm. well. And the book is Money Ways. Yes. And the, the, the culture between authors is to exchange books. Yes, yes. So mm -hmm. I want to exchange this one mm -hmm. for another. I know this one I bought, but yes. I want another one. <laughs> and the reason I want another one is yeah. to actually give um, people who are watching okay. the show. Okay. So uh, in a few minutes, I'll decide how, okay. who gets, who gets Done. a copy. So I'll give, a copy, I'll give away a copy of mine. All right. And also I'll give away a copy of, of, of your book. Excellent. So here is mine. <laughs> thank you, thank you very much. And I'll hand over. Super, mine. thank you. So, guys, you so this much. book is a gem, like for real. Um, I, Tony has not paid to be here. I had to plead with him to come <laughs> on the show. So, I am not paid for this, but it's, it's actually been very, very helpful. And if we can have more chamas that are doing the kind of things Center yeah. Meets doing, yep. you know, I mean, really, yep. we are going to transform as a country. The yeah. government will be looking to companies such as those to, to fund Absolutely. projects, you know, Absolutely. as opposed to going to get, you know, issue a euro bond and, and being highly Precisely. indebted to foreign governments, Precisely. you know. Um, so the questions that have been asked, at what age yep. can you start? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> From the first month you become an earner after <laughs> you leave school, you have your first job, just get into the discipline of saving, of forming a chama to begin with. Because, you know, as we all know, many of our lifelong uh, friends and uh, people that you are going to share experience with, ex experiences with for the rest of your life are people that you will meet in school. Uh, or these may be your family members or your colleagues that you actually come across at work. But from the moment you start earning an income, because the earlier you start, the less you actually have to contribute to achieve what I call this desired retirement income. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. So if you start at 25, you have 35 years before you retire. Mm. I gave you some statistics earlier on, on what you need to contribute every month, earning about 13% return uh, month on month over a certain 
um, period of time. So at 25, you have 35 years. What you have to contribute is just above 5,000 shillings a month to get you 100,000 shillings as retirement income, as a net monthly income. Wow. Now compare that to the 20,000 that you need to save and invest if you're 35, mm -hmm. if you're 10 years older. By the time you get to 50, I think the figure is something like about 120,000 shillings. You get 100,000 yes. income. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. At the end. Because what you're trying to do is to end up saving uh, um, a, a capital base, uh, the, as I call it. So you've invested actively, you've tried to maximize the returns on your investments, but at some point as you get towards retirement, you cannot afford to take as many risks as you did earlier on. Right. And ideally you want to have this capital invested in relatively risk-free um, investments, government mm -hmm. securities um, and you know things like that yeah. at a much lower return. So start from day one. Okay. Start from day one. Um, another question from John. How would you address... Yeah, this is a fantastic mm. question. How would you address the equality or equity debate if members have different contributions? How would that difference in shareholders affect voters' rights? <laughs> You've addressed it in the book. But yes. You know, please yes. go ahead. Okay. Um, very, very good question. And I think uh, there is a, I will always use this word mindset, that the best way to ensure equality within a group is to make sure everybody is contributing the same amount month on month, okay? But I honestly believe that that limits the capacity of that group to invest significantly more over a longer period of time. So what I'd, uh, I'd, I'd advise is to set um, a minimum monthly contribution that everybody can work within, okay? But don't be limited by what I had referred, what you had referred to before as uh, only saving what you can afford to lose, mm. you know, contribute and save what you cannot afford to lose, mm. okay? So, you know, you've got to push yourself, but have a minimum monthly that everybody should uh, or must comply with, okay? And then above that, if you can afford to contribute a thousand, ten thousand, fifty thousand more every month, do so, because it, it expands the pool of capital that you're able to invest yeah. and you can invest in, uh, you know, higher return opportunities, more lucrative opportunities, um, and you're able to achieve your goal of, uh, you know, producing this uh, desired retirement income a lot sooner. Now, voting rights. Um, we go to the issue of governance, and this is why governance is important. The decision makers, okay, where you're going to invest, how you're going to invest. First of all, you'll be governed by a document called an, an investment policy, an investment manual that every shareholder needs to be in agreement with. So it'll be very specific about what you can and cannot invest in, all right? But uh, once you put together this board, and by no, you know, do not have every single member of your chama sitting on this board. I think it's a recipe for chaos, mm. okay? If every shareholder in Safaricom sat on the board, <laughs> anyway, you'll know that's totally unrealistic. Um, but it doesn't matter how much shareholding or how much each of the members of that board have contributed. So one may have, a, have contributed a total of 50,000 shillings, um, but they're sitting on the board. And somebody else may have contributed uh, 2 million shillings. They're sitting on the board. Mm -hmm. Governance, memorandum and articles of association uh, dictate that every board member has one vote. Okay? So it doesn't matter whether you're a small shareholder or a large shareholder. And that board is the decision-making authority around where we are going to invest, how we are going to invest, um, governed by that investment manual that all shareholders have had an opportunity to, to give there and, and have to approve. Yeah. Um, and um, there are also what are called shareholder reserved matters, okay, that are also part of, you know, I talk about it in the group, having a shareholders agreement, yes. okay? So shareholder reserved matters are matters that every shareholder um, has to uh, be in agreement with, okay? 
or let's say up to 75% of the shareholding. But in, in many cases, it's every shareholder. And you, as a small shareholder, has the same voting right as the individual with a large shareholder, with large shareholding um, on these matters. And these uh, revolve around whether you're going to now start getting involved in mergers with other companies, whether you're <coughs> investing above a certain amount. If it's a very large investment that the Chama is doing, then you need to get all shareholders to approve. To approve okay? So not just this little board. Not just the little board. So have no fear. And, and, uh, and you know, it goes back to the question of looking at, um, let's take live examples. You know, you have the transcentuaries, you have the centums that are sort of the better known in investment groups or had their roots in the sort of Chama mm. um, vehicle. Um, the single largest investor um, in each, in any of these investment groups, uh, does not dictate where investments are going to be made. Forget about what the perception is, mm -hmm. <laughs> what the public thinks, or what individual shareholders in these uh, investment companies say, mm. okay? It is the board that is going to decide, okay? Let's decide management you go and implement, not the individual. So unless, you know, you, you have one individual who is I mean and, and this is not a chama now it's just an individual who as a business person has their own company and you know they they can make all the decisions but um even if you look at uh, some of the global examples some of the very large investment companies globally um they they are they're accountable to their shareholders they're accountable to their boards so have no fear you know you know be willing to contribute any member of your chama can contribute whatever they're able to but have this minimum contribution that everybody uh, should comply with. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's that's great. I hope that helps you, John. Um, let's see. There's another question by Linda. Apart from land and unit trust, what else can Chamas <laughs> invest in? And then the other question is, where can the book be found? Yeah. So where else can Chamas? Okay. Um, I referred to. Investment planning. Um, it is something your chama has to work on. A dedicated task. So you you will decide of the X amount that the chama is raising every month or every year. How much am I going to put in your sort of short term, more liquid, meaning that when you you can sell a lot quicker and get your cash um, a lot quicker, but the the return is is typically lower. Um, how much am I going to invest in the shorter term investments? How much am I going to invest in the sort of the medium term investments? Yeah. So we're talking about uh, shares, there are some um, debt instruments or fixed income securities that you are committed to locking in for a certain period of time. And then you have the, the higher earning but less liquid investments. Um, now we're moving to the space of real estate and, and private equity. So. In terms of other options, apart from land and, and uh, money market, have this agreement on short, medium, and long-term investments, right? In terms of higher returns, you know, I sometimes don't like using the word private equity. It's, it's too fancy a word for what simply means just invest in, in other businesses, okay? Um, so, you know, there are people that are looking for capital to finance their businesses, all right? Entrepreneurs who have been doing this for X number of years, yeah. they typically only think of the banks or what I call the, f the three Fs, the, the friends, the families, and the fools, fools yeah? Mm -hmm. As a source of capital. Mm. Um, but you as a chama have an opportunity to invest in ventures like this, okay? But it's tough <laughs> because uh, these are group these are investors or intrapre entrepreneurs excuse me that have never had chamas investing with them so there's a there's a courtship phase you've got to really get to know each other mm. you've got to know the business of this entrepreneur the entrepreneur themselves very 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 important okay and um, 
you know, put in X amount, you, you become a shareholder, you can, you know, most of the time it's going to be a minority shareholder, but see if you can lock in a uh, shareholding of say 20 to 40%. But remember, this is a long-term investment, okay? If you're 25, you're looking at a 35-year retirement period. So you may be invested in this company for that long, um, but you've got to give it time to actually grow and with the understanding that additional capital calls may be made on you. Um, but in terms of the potential return in the long term, it can be extremely lucrative. And we have examples in this, in this yeah. country. How did Java start? Yeah. Okay. Chamas could have invested in Java Imagine. instead of private equity yeah. funds. And look at the kind of money they've Returns, made. You know, it was a small restaurant yeah. in Adam's Arcade former tumbas you yeah. know that um has become this this giant mm. and there are several other examples of entrepreneurs that have started businesses like this they're looking for capital mm. and this is where the power of groups comes in exactly in fact that that statement you've made yeah um is important because I, I i don't think groups should come in to just pass money from one person to another to another this thing we call yeah. a merry ground yes. it doesn't make yes. sense yes. in yes. fact you're adding a layer of risk yeah. because someone can decide they're not so i think don't come together to do a merry go round yeah. doesn't true, make sense true, true, you can true. start that way but you know don't stay that way long exactly um the other thing is don't do what you can do by yourself mm -hmm. Just at a unit trust, money market, yes, and shares. Yes, that's passive investing. Yeah, yes, no. Yes, I yes. think it's important if you're coming together, that vision needs to be a big yeah, vision. Yeah. One of the values you mentioned. Exactly. It needs to be a meaningful vision where yeah. we're going to buy companies, we're going to do real estate projects mm, that are meaningful yeah. that I wouldn't have been able to do on my own. Otherwise, yeah. then it doesn't make sense to come yeah. in as a group. Yeah. Um, so for those who are thinking about what do we invest in as a group. Um, time is like really running okay. so I have another one um, thank you Joshua thank you for your um, comments he says that he's really loving the show that we're really enlightening him on what he needs to do with his finances mm -hmm. now Ron is asking what are the immediate steps to take to revive an inactive chama it's a, it great, question. It is a great question how do you get buy-in from mm -hmm. members. Mm -hmm. I remember Sweet, yes, right? Yes, yes. There were these two who were just like, we have yeah. to make this thing work. Yes. The others were like, whatever, man, yes. you guys are on your own. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so the question is, what are the media steps to take um, to revive an inactive chama? Another one is, um, we have a chama that's struggling. Members contributed initially, but now some are not. Mm -hmm. Very few of us uh, are, are at par with the others. Mm -hmm. Do we return their money and continue with the serious ones? What do you advise? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, let's just do those first. Okay, all right. <laughs> okay. Uh, so reviving Achama, I mean, um, some of the answers are in the book, so buy the yeah, book. I, uh, by the way, <laughs> get the book. Uh, <laughs> exactly, and in the case study, as you mentioned, you know, the, this sweet group went exactly, went through this experience exactly. Um, you've got to have what I call a come to Jesus moment. A come to Jesus moment. A come moment. to Jesus moment okay. as a group, Okay. And if you've been really struggling, it's been very inactive, and there's a number of members in the group that are serious about getting started. I think you, you have got to come together. Um, there are certain principles, must-dos, that have to happen to create this foundation for you to, to really get started again. And uh, a number of them have to do with governance in terms of how are you going to organize yourselves. So we need a chairman. Yes. We need, you know, like we need a directors. A secretary. We need a secretary. You know, these office bearers, okay, that have very specific responsibilities and are really committed to the group. And those things need to be documented. They need what to you're be calling documented. the board charter. These are exactly. the roles of the board. Mm -hmm. Exactly. The roles of the board, the roles of the treasurer, the roles of the, of the secretary as well. Um, but some of these roles you will eventually now be outsourcing to professional service providers but start within the group okay um, so this can be done in the way of a formal shareholder meeting you know bring this group together but there, there has to be a core group that is driving this revival okay um, and there are certain uh, you know there, there are other I think one of the most important governance documents is the shareholders agreement. So come up with a shareholders agreement, okay? So, so for people who are watching and have yes. never heard that term yes. before, let's yeah. just break down. What is this shareholders agreement? It is like your, your constitution, Okay. all right? It's a document 
that very, very clearly lays out how you are going to undertake your business as a, as a group, how you're going to take care of um, certain potential challenges that come about in the group. If there's a member that has not been contributing, how do you treat that particular situation? You know, uh, if they're what I call um, good liver, bad livers, there, there's a member that is disruptive. Uh, they're simply not interested in <coughs> the, 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 the future, the welfare of this group. Is there a way of removing them that is very clearly set out in, in this uh, shareholders agreement? Yeah. Okay. Um, so it will also in, in indicate what the minimum monthly contribution is going to be. It will indicate um, how many meetings you're going to be holding as a, as a board. It will indicate the other governance structures. You'll have your board, but you'll have the most important committee uh, is, is the investment committee. All right. And what are the roles of that investment committee? So it, it lays out all the rules and regulations that this group needs to comply with and every single member has to sign up to it right mm. so once you have that in place some members in this group that you're trying to revive me say man this is too much for me this you're getting too serious for me yeah. chama was just friends welfare nini, yeah. nini. i'm out and fine it's, it's okay to leave okay but you will have that core group that remains and is committed to then taking things forward yes. all right um and uh, you, you then, once you have uh, decided on this core group that's willing to take things forward, then you've now got to think about um, your, your vision. Where are you going with this thing? All right. So the investment planning that I talked about. So as we are raising this money, this is how we're going to allocate it. Okay. And this is how we're going to invest this money. Is the, the chair of the investment group going to be responsible for actually executing investments? Um, what is the role of the chair? What is the everybody has to have a role, yeah. even the members that are not part of these governance structures as well. Very important is uh, sharing of information. Okay, it's part of the trust. Sharing of information. Sharing of information. What are our contribution? What's the contribution status? Mm. Let's start with the simplest one. Okay, I need to know how much money I've contributed. And what the value of that money is, okay? Yeah, every month. Every single month. Yeah. Every single month. You know, you're not going to wait for two years and then scramble to figure out papers have been lost, statements, you can't find them anymore, you know, um, to, to come up with uh, your contributions, uh, which, which endears a level of trust among the membership. Okay, I know where my money is. It's, it's like your bank. If your bank can't give you a oh statement, gosh, yeah. they tell you, okay, why don't you wait for two, three months? We'll <laughs> let you know how much you have in your bank. It's the same thing. Yeah. Okay. This yeah. is the same commodity. It's, it's money. Um, and then at, at some point, have, uh, a, 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 you know, set aside a period of time. Um, again, a fancy word for this is strategic planning. Okay. Where your group can now come together to form, um, decide on a vision. Where do we want to take this thing? Where do we want to be, you know, uh, at the point where we are, we, are, we are nearing retirement? And how are we going to get there? What is the retirement income that we're looking for? And how can this group help us achieve that retirement income? Mm. So that's what I'd advise. Wow. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Let's see whether we'll answer one more question. This, uh, um, Oh, my dad has commented. Oh, yes. <laughs> he so says, excellent presentation, terrible. Rina. Well done, Tony Wainaina. You have articulated Chama Investments with clarity and depth. Um, Thomas says, great topic. Our Chama wants to start lending, but different from VSLA. I'm not sure what that means. Mm -hmm. Are there government mm -hmm. regulations and tax to be paid for this kind of value addition to our Chama money? Mm -hmm. Are they, just repeat the question. It says, uh, our Chama wants to start lending. Okay but different from VSLA. Mm -hmm. uh, are these, I'm sorry, are these, are there, sorry, are there government regulations and tax to be paid for this kind of value addition to a Chama money? First of all, I mean, again, it's, it's, it's a very personal view that I have. I, I really don't believe Chamas should be lending money to each other, okay? 
Oh, so he means within the group. I, that's what, what that I'm, means? That's what I'm okay. getting from this. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, tell me why. Be because a lot of chamas do lend to each other. Yes. And I think that's more of a, you know, a, a welfare mindset that you are creating this group to take care of your individual's immediate needs, okay? Now, you're lending to them so that they can do what with this money, okay? So maybe school fees, it may be other immediate uh, cons consumption needs that need to be taken care of. Yeah. It could be so that I can buy a piece of land. Why not buy this piece of land as a group, okay? And you're lending, you're minimizing the opportunity for that group to earn returns. That's one. so true. Okay? Yes. So you're going to lend, but you're not going to lend at the bank rate. No. Okay? You're going to lend at a very nominal yeah. sort of, you know, almost, let me just make, cover my costs, 5%, 10%. Mm. So you're limiting the opportunity of the larger group. But it's also risky. And, and this then begins to jeopardize that, that, that glue that holds the group together, mm. okay? Any bank that is going to lend is going to do what? Due diligence. Due diligence. Are you going to do due diligence on your member? No. Okay, no, of you course not. You trust them. You trust them, mm. okay? Even, even the, the more in, well, like, l relatively less formal lending structure that we have with SACOs, there, there's a... There's a, there, there are rules and regulations that have to be followed. Yes, you can borrow three times what you've uh, saved. But if you don't, you know, but there's a certain level of due diligence that's done. Can you show us your pay slips? Can you do what, do what? And then you, you, you are credible. You're a credible borrower and we'll give you this money, all right? But what happens in the event that you default, okay? Okay, as a group, it's going to be very difficult for you to start saying that, uh, okay, um, we are either go we're giving you X number of months. If you haven't paid us back, you're, you're out, okay? Have you taken security for that uh, lending you've given to your group member, all right? Um, do they run the risk of losing their entire shareholding um, if they exit? So it's, it's very difficult. It's contentious. Yeah. But above all else, it just limits the capacity of the group, even if you just put your money in money market funds, you, you as a better. group are yeah. going to do better than lending to each other. Okay, mm -hmm. so I would I would I would stay away from that. All right, um, but if you are doing this, I mean uh, I mean, if Chama's if you're a limited liability company, that is you you you're just going to be governed by the rule by the Companies Act at the end of the day, and the Companies Act doesn't really say much about. Um, you know, insider lending, as it were, within the company, okay? Um, are they withholding taxes that have to be paid on interest? I, I suspect that, you know, if it, if it is a formal loan, and again, you need to have, and a lot of groups don't do this if they're lending, they don't have a, a loan agreement, okay, or a shareholder loan agreement that's been signed between the borrower and, and the group themselves. But... Um, I will actually stop there. Just <laughs> advise groups not to lend to each other. Mm. You know, this is a, a, an investment vehicle that is supposed to be generating superior returns for the benefit of all the members. Yeah. yeah. Agreed. Yeah. And imagine we're going to stop there because Ooh, we are done. Time has run out. Okay. But you have to come back. I'll be back. We shall find back. a way of getting you back. Yeah. I'll Thank you back. so much. I really appreciate the time. You're very welcome. Um, and I'm going to do something silly because my children, every time I go home, are like, you didn't say hi to us. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to say hi. <laughs> hi, Kapura. Hi, Lusajo. Hi, to say. I hope you're watching. Um, guys, thank you so much for watching. Thank you for your questions. Thank you for consistently asking. I've been receiving questions around investing. And over the last couple of months, actually since half of last year, I've been working on an investment course. So I have an announcement to make. In October, we're going to be launching an online program. Uh, which is fantastic. By the way, we've been working on this so hard and I will tell you with who and we're going to be launching this program in October. So I want you to do this. If you are interested in um, taking an, an, uh, a program and the way we're going to do it is not just online, we shall have it in in such a way that you'll have accountability groups, we'll have uh, opportunities for you to ask questions live. So it's not just all online and I want you to send me an email sema at moneywise.co.ke with your name, phone number, and we will be able to 
put together the register and I'm going to try and negotiate a, a, a good rate um, or a discount for those who are in the first group. So please send me your details so that you can get into this first group. Sema at moneywise.co.ke. Now, this, these books, there are two books I'm giving. The Investment Handbook from Chama to Conglomerate. So if you want to move your investment group <laughs> from Chama to Conglomerate, you have to get this book. And I'm going to give away one copy of this. And one copy of Moneyways, which is my book that um, talks about saving, investing, the different options, where to start. It's your basic 101 uh, with stories and examples. And this is also very, very helpful because it gives case studies as well. Um, so there are two people and um, the criteria is send me um, an, a, a message on Facebook or on YouTube uh, tagged to this video um, why I should give you this book, either the Chama book, the investment group handbook by Tony Wainaina or Money Wise. Tell me why. And the one that has the most um, compelling reason shall get a free copy of the book. Otherwise, guys, subscribe. Have a fantastic weekend and we shall see you next week. Bye bye. Great. Thank you so much. You're very welcome.